Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. So my wife and kids are at home today, a little sick, so I told them I would say hi to them. Hey guys, love you. So, all right. Here we go. So today we're going to be talking about joy and strength. Um, I wanted to start with a, a story. So I, I have a friend, him and his wife are having a baby in about um, a month, maybe a little less than that. And so about a month ago, I helped him um, basically redo the room that's going to be the nursery. And so they've pre prepped the room, and him and his uncle have worked together to get supplies ready for us to be able to drywall in mud. And I know some of you guys do that every day for your job, and you can do it with your eyes closed, but I haven't done that in years, and so I was like, oh man, I hope I just don't mess this thing up. Um, and so I show up um, the, the day to do this, and luckily I was like, man, I don't have any tools. Like, I'm looking in my closet. I got a toolbox with like one screwdriver, and there's three zip ties. <laughs> and that's my whole, that's my whole toolbox. <laughs> and so I was like, man, so many of the guys in this room are disappointed in me right now. But... <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I was like, luckily, I show up and everything is prepared for, for us to, to do the job well. It's like, thank God, I didn't want to look silly here. Uh, so we show up in like eight-hour day because, you know, I'm not really in the mode of doing this. And so, and then after like 10 minutes of him showing us stuff, uh, my, my buddy's uncle it's like, oh no, I remember how to do this. It's just been a while. I'm not in practice for this. And so the, the reason I share this is like I could have showed up to do that with a butter knife and super glue and like rusty nails and I would have gotten the job done and it just wouldn't be the right tool for the right job, right? And so when I think about preaching and the teaching that we do on Sundays, it's like the, the goal here is to equip the saints for ministry and, and for the, the walk that they have. And what I want for, for you, um, what we want from you to get away from the preaching is to have the right tools for the job that you are to do, right? Um, it's like, they had these little pouches with all the drywall screws in them, and like I've got basketball shorts, and they're just going in there, and it's poking me the whole time, and it's like, well, you know, I don't have the right, and yep, it works, but I want the right tools for the right job, and that's what I want for you, right? And so I just say that as, as a preface um, before we get into t today's topic, um, the right tools for the right job so we can actually live out our life uh, with the power intended, right? Um, man, we have a job to do and it's exciting and it's supernatural. It's fun to move with God and play a part in God's story, right? We just need the right tools for that job and I'm gonna tell you today that the right tool is joy, the right tool, the tool that you really need is joy. Amen. So there's something interesting that I've noticed in church. I've been around church my whole life. I'm sure uh, some of you would be able to, to see this as well. Um, there is a certain breed of people, right? When you, when you hang out around church, enough, you start to see this just like, ah, there's something different about her, there's something different about him, right? They just have the right posture, the right attitude. They're positive. They have the right response to challenges, right? Uh, people want to be around them. They make people feel wanted and loved. They are always willing to serve, right, no matter what it is. You don't have to be worried about offending them. You don't have to walk on eggshells around them because they are thinking the best of every situation, it's a breath of fresh air to be around them, right? We have people around us that like completely drain our emotional capacity, not these people, right? Not the people I'm talking about. They fill it, right? A 30 minute coffee date uh, with one of these people fills you up with fire for God again and you feel ready to take on the day. Okay, you, you know these people? Do you have these people in your life? Can you recognize them? Do you know who they are? They have a defining characteristic 
and it's not defined by their, their circumstances, right? I know plenty of people that are like this going through really hard journeys, right? Um, it's not their stage in life because sometimes it's people that were just born again that are the most excited and on fire for God, right? Uh, so it's definitely not their stage in life or their maturity level in the faith, right? It's definitely not their status in the church, right? I, I like so many, like, have you ever met like, just a grumpy pastor? Like, yeah, I've met a whole bunch of them, right? Right? Like, I've met a lot. And so it's definitely not this, like their status in the church that would, that would make them these people that we want to be around that drastically impact our life. It's this. They're joyful people. Right? One of my favorites here is probably putting her on the spot a little bit, but Regina, who holds the signs outside when you're driving in. My gosh, that, and I'll just say, say this, that woman carries an anointing of joy. She gets it. You want, you want to like just receive what this is, like look at her life, right? Um, joyous ones, Right? And that's who we are to be. We'll get, we'll get into it. But these are people that they choose joy, they live in joy, they pour out joy. And it's funny because it's a topic that we don't often talk about. But when somebody walks into the room with joy, with the joy of the Lord, the atmosphere changes. Conversations change. Tones of conversations change. Postures change. I don't know about you, but I want to be a person who can command an atmosphere. Not because I'm important, not because I'm prideful, but because God has done something so powerful in me that things around me change when I'm involved in them, right? And that's what I, he wants for you. Man. I don't know about you, but I want to be a person that overflows with what God is doing inside of me. I want worldly things to lose their influence and their power because I'm involved in a situation. That's what Jesus does, and that's what I and you are destined to become. So normally when this topic comes up in church circles, we normally hear this kind of delineation, right? The difference between happiness and joy right? This, this comes up a lot. It goes something like this. I mean, tell me if you've heard this before, but happiness is circumstantial or fleeting. Joy is lasting and it comes from God, right? We've heard that. The, hard, the only hard part I have with this is like joy and happiness are kind of used interchangeably all throughout scripture. And so instead of like a difference, making a difference between happiness and joy, what I would, I think a better framework for us to think about this is the source of for a Christian's joy is different than the source of joy for someone that lives in the world, right? There is a difference. The world finds joy and happiness every day through advancement, growth, gain, through first love, through babies, through new jobs, and on and on. None of these things are inherently bad. Christians find joy in these things as well, and you should. You should find joy in these things, right? Scripture teaches us in James 1.17 that every good and perfect gift is from above. If it's good, it's from God. He made it, Right? Good things and goodness originate in him. Still, these are things that are circumstantial and they can be stripped away from us, right? The rain of life falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all face the same challenges. Here's what's different between us as Christians, as believers in Christ, and the world and the source of their joy. Right? This is in um, Psalms 16, 11, and we'll pull that up here. You make known to me the path of life. You have filled me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. 
The Christian has joy not because of circumstances of things, but because the Lord of Lords, the most valuable one in all creation, is close to us. And does he only walk with us through good times? No, we write even in the valley of the shadow of death, he walks with us, right? The source of joy. Uh, no matter what is going on, he is there. Because he is there, I am joyful. Right? So we celebrate not just the goodness we see from an earthly perspective, right? Uh, the promotion at work, the new baby, the first love, those are incredible things to enjoy. But my lasting joy comes from this. I, I am known and I know him and he is close with me, right? I will gain an, increased, an increasing measure of love and understanding all the days of my life and all for eternity because I am close to God. Right? This is our source of joy. The world's source of joy is in temporal things that are fading faster than we think. The Christian's joy is in eternal things, right? Uh, with, what does it say, Psalm 16? With eternal pleasures at your right hand. Eternal pleasures. And this is the big, the big difference for, for us and for the world. If you want l- true and lasting joy, turn your heart towards eternal things rather than temporal things. So this topic for me, like generally when I'm gonna preach, um, I, what my normal process with God is like I will sit the same way I do devotions, you know, all throughout the week. I sit, I write, maybe that's two sentences that I get this day and nothing the next day and four paragraphs the next day. And, and so um, about a month ago, um, I'm just sitting down, going through some, some verses in the Psalms, and I just found this connection between joy and strength. And I didn't, now, so what it is, it's Nehemiah 8.10 is the first one, and then Psalms 21 is the second one. I'll just, we won't turn there, but I'll just tell you what they say. The Nehemiah 8.10, right, this is where we get the passage, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right, you've all heard this before, right? We did Nehemiah, so I hope so. (laughs) Um, But the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, this is the interesting one. When I was in Psalms 21, verse one, I saw this. This is David. The king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great is his joy in the victories you give. And so there's this connection. God's joy is my strength. God's strength is my joy. And I didn't, like, okay, there's some kind of connection here and I'm just not seeing it. And so I just like kind of chew on that for a couple of weeks. And really what I came out of that with is this understanding, both joy and strength are things we need that originate in God, things that we don't have, right, on our own. But by being close to him, we receive both, right? And I think we think about the, the strength thing quite often, like I'll be able to endure um, the closer I am to God. I'll be able to handle challenges. I'll be able to respond the right way or win against temptation, right? But in both of these, there's this connection to joy. And that's something that, like, I mean, I've thought about this before, but I, like, it just struck me new this time. God connects so clearly the strength that you need, the strength that I need to his joy and him giving both. So I'm just sitting on this for a while and, and, it, and it brought me to, to Acts 5. Um, you don't have to turn there. I'm just gonna summarize the story there. And... Um, and so in, in Acts 5, right, this starts with Ananias and Sapphira, but then it goes into um, the apostles being persecuted. They preach, they're persecuted, they're put into prison. An angel lets them out and says, go preach more. So they go right back to where they were arrested and they begin preaching again the next day, right? And so the end of this story, there's, a, there's two verses here. This is Acts 5, uh, verse 40 and 41, They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. 
This is the point. Did you know that you could be so close to Jesus, so filled and overflowing with his spirit, so tapped into the river of eternal life that even a flogging could produce joy? Now, that sounds strange to think about. They were beat, right? Just put, put this picture in your mind. Like, we go preach, they throw me into prison, crazy angelic encounter in the, the middle of the night, and we're released, and then told to go right back to where we got arrested to preach again. And then I'm beat for it, and then I'm sent away. And me and my friends can't help but to laugh at the goodness of God. Right? What a strange image for us, right? How? How is that their response? Eternal pleasures produce joy in me because they produce his joy. I want what he wants. Our desires are the same. You are strongest when your joy is in what delights your heavenly father. This is where strength comes in, right? Alignment. We have the same heart. We have the same mind. God gets joy giving me strength to do his will. God is strong and I can trust him and this fills me with joy. I'm never lacking strength or joy because they come from his limitless supply. Before we move on, I just wanna say, I believe today, I believe this is like a, a, a prophetic word or um, maybe a word of knowledge for some of you today. I believe that some of you are struggling with areas of either sin or doubt and you've been trying to wrestle it and beat it into submission. But the way out is the strength found in joy. I would encourage you if that relates to you, if you feel that today when we do a closing song, Come up to the front here and receive prayer, right? Come up to the front here and, and realign your heart to receive joy in what God finds pleasure in, right? So, Jesus, the joyous one, right? This is, um, this is a really interesting one. A, uh, we'll start with Psalms 45, and this is verse seven and eight. Our joy comes from closeness to God and alignment in his heart and, and, uh, 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 and alignment in heart and desires with our heavenly father. So this, this verse has really like messed with my theology. It took me a while to really grasp this. This is the amazing thing about scripture, just two simple verses, right? It's, it's one, two sentences. But the implications of this passage of scripture change the way we see Jesus, just totally. And it's this, right? And this is a prophetic declaration that is then fulfilled by Jesus in the Psalms. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Did you know that scripture tells us there was nothing about his appearance that would make us desire him but it also tells us there has never been a more joyful person to walk the face of the earth. When you think of Jesus, is that what you think of? The most joyful person to walk the face of the earth, anointed with the oil of gladness beyond all his companions. I don't know, when I think of Jesus, a lot of times it's like the passion of the Christ, like somber, sad, doing really hard things, Jesus. Right? That's what I think of. That's where my mind naturally goes. And maybe that's the way we portray Jesus a lot. Right? Um, but Scripture tells us something very different. Like, no wonder people are so drawn to him. There's nothing great about his appearance, but yet multitudes would gather and just want to be around him, even when they don't understand what's going on with him. Like, who is he? Is he a prophet? Is he a teacher? Is he crazy? Is he the son of God? Is he the Messiah? And without understanding, they still just wanted to flock to him and be around him. And this verse in Psalms 45 makes this make so much sense. 
Of course they wanted to be him. There's never been someone more filled with joy walking the face of the earth than the living, breathing, incarnate son of God. I used to go to a, a conference. Um, I went, I think, four years in a row in Pennsylvania. And I remember the first time we go there, I'm like heading into the first meeting, excited to be there. And it's like one of those, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, hear 15 sermons and, and hang out and learn a bunch about Jesus. It's wonderful. But they had this photo on the wall, and I want to see if we can put that, that up. I guess I'll get out of the way here. It, this is what I saw on the wall in this church. And is this what you think of when you think of Jesus? And I think the answer is like, oh, of course not. Of course not, right? I don't think of Jesus like this. And I think this is the point today of what I believe God is, I, I believe God is doing something very real here today for you and for, uh, for me, is that he's showing us today, like, no, this is who I am. I'm filled with joy, completely filled to overflowing with joy. And the strength that you need is found in this Jesus, a Jesus that's not bothered by the things to come. He's sovereign. He knows the end, right? It's all his inheritance. It's all coming back to him. He heard in the water, right, at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased full communion with God the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He's walking in fullness. And so this is what fullness looks like. Jesus is a joyous one. Did you know that God is in a good mood? He, he is good. He's making good things. He's not worried about tomorrow. He's filled with love. Did you know, right, Zephaniah 3.17, God delights in you? Like when he thinks about you, he thinks good and happy things. He's happy to be around you. And some of you really need to hear this. God is smiling over you. When he thinks about you, he thinks good things. He loves just to be around you. You are being formed into the image of Christ. A defining characteristic of this, right? A, a level in maturity, I would say it that way too, is the state of your joy. So Jesus is a joyous one. You are called to be a joyous one. Who are the joyous ones? They're the ones who believe against all odds. The ones who continue time after time to pray in faith, believing. The ones who engage in situations knowing God is involved and they are looking for him, right? Not just God out there. Their eyes are fixed on situations waiting for God to move. Right? The joyous ones have hearts that deeply love the work of God. Testimonies are their favorite conversations. They are so excited about what God is doing, they hunger and thirst to be anywhere God is moving. They dance and sing and cry in worship and they are filled with gratitude. The joyous ones are movers and shakers. The fuel to the fire of revival, pouring out their passion and love into all that God has called them and their church. God is reminding us today that joy is your inheritance. I'm just going to go to John 15. This is John 15, um, verses 9 to 11. And this is really my challenge for you today. We're going to have the, the band come back up for a closing song as well. This is John 15, starting in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain 
in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And here's verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. If you want to look like Jesus, remain in his love for you until his joy is complete and full in you. Don't miss this. This is such an easy thing to miss. Wait, like I know God loves them. God loves me. God delights in me. But I know me, and I don't know if I love me, right? That's the response most of us are going to have. God delights in you. He loves you. And if you remain in his love, his joy will be complete in you and you will overflow. Would you stand with me? We're gonna do a closing song and then I have just a word to share in closing uh, today. And I would just encourage you as we worship and we sing our closing song today, soak in this reality that God delights in you, he loves you, he longs to be around you and the strength that you need for your life is going to come not from your striving, not from intense effort, right? Not from learning one more thing, not from advancement. The strength that you need for your journey with God is going to come from joy. Delight in what God delights in. Amen.